Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Ryan Frain. I'm a faculty member at Dalhousie University in the Division of Kinesiology. Uh, Dalhousie University is in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is in Canada, for those of you that don't know. And uh, I want to thank the Goalie Symposium, specifically Dr. Cheryl McDonald, for inviting me to do this talk today and give me the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research at Dal, uh, which focuses on improving goaltender safety and performance. So, who am I? For those of you that don't know who I am, I have a similar background to probably many of you watching, uh, and even those who have done uh, presentations for the Goaltender Symposium. I am a goalie, I grew up a goalie, which you can see on the left hand side, and I still try to play the position today. Um, but why am I so passionate about the game? Well, much like all of you guys, uh, I love the position, but there's a specific quote that I like to use that really describes my passion for the game. And that quote comes from Game Change, a book written by Ken Dryden, talking about the life and times of Steve Montador. And that quote specifically states, hockey may have seemed an all out damn the consequences game, but it was always a compromise between performance and safety. And it's those last three words is what's made me love the sport of hockey and specifically goaltending. We have a really delicate balance between performance and safety. We want to maximize the performance of goaltenders, drop down the goals against averages, but we want to make sure that goaltenders maintain that level of safety as we do know that injuries are fairly common in this population and something we'll talk a lot more about. Now, within my research, I do focus on the balance between performance and safety, and I do that in two specific ways. The first is through a great industrial research partnership with CCM Hockey, where we test prototype and new modified gear for safety and performance. We need to make sure we maintain that balance between equipment performance and equipment safety, which as I talk to you a little bit later on throughout this talk, you'll note that that is a bit of a delicate balance. And the second thing I've tried to dabble a little bit more into, which is goalie performance tracking. Just trying to understand load management, which is obviously a bit of a hot topic or was a hot topic when Kawhi Leonard was in Toronto with the Raptors. But it's something we're starting to hear a lot more about with number one goalies. And it's something that I think there is a big opportunity to improve upon within the goaltender literature. So... Let's talk about a little bit about the background of it and the effects of personal protective equipment in the workplace, specifically for goaltenders. So I'm saying workplace here because some of this literature comes from military and um, firefighting backgrounds, but there's also goaltending work here. But there's a lot of parallels between the two, so I'm grouping them together. So equipment that surrounds the limbs. We know that goaltenders wear 15 to 20 kilograms of gear. It gets heavier as they're on the ice because it's absorbing sweat. Lesser to the extent now, but it also absorbs water off of the ice. But we know that it increases cardiovascular function and it increases sweat loss. As a result, it can decrease muscular power and cognitive function. This image on the right hand side is perfect. You have a goaltender, which I believe is in the KHL, like, I don't know that for sure. He's in the middle of a game. There is literally the guys in the blue are, have come down and attacked the net and he's turned around drinking the water bottle. It's a fantastic image to show that this individual is extremely dehydrated and thirsty, but is now having a small cognitive malfunction because they are not paying attention to what they should be doing. So I thought this picture summed up the top four points quite well. The next point is joint ranges of motion. As those of you who have played the sport know that you can move your arms around and move your legs around much differently than you can the moment you put on all that gear. And we've done a little bit of research in that as well. Now, all those things combined can actually lead to goaltender musculoskeletal injuries. In fact, 93.8% of elite goaltenders have radiographic evidence for what they call a cam deformity. Specifically, a cam deformity is a type of femoral acetabular impingement, which is a bony overgrowth on the femoral neck, which we can see right here, that red zone on the femoral neck on that second uh, black and white image. Now, the reason that that happens, there's kind of three major reasons that we know of that are causing it uh, or could potentially be causing these injuries. And the first is compromised hip postures. And I'm going to use the example on the right hand side there of Marc-Andre Fleury in a very common position known as the butterfly. You guys all know that position very well. And it's really the cornerstone for many of goaltender or many of the goaltender movements that we see today. And 
as we know that when goaltenders drop into this position, they're dropping quickly, flaring their ankles laterally to block the lower half of the net. But in order to do that, their anatomy is actually resulting in a hip flexion and a really large internal rotation. And it's that combination of large internal rotation and hip flexion that decreases the space between the femoral neck of the femur and the acetabular rim of the pelvis. And then you have a potential chance of having bone-on-bone -bone contact. That bone-on-bone -bone contact can lead to uh, labral tears and then obviously the, the slow development of a cam deformity or even a pincer deformity, but it's just lesser common. The next thing that we know that could potentially be resulting in these uh, injuries is we have this combination effect of transient forces that are occurring. Goaltenders are dropping really hard to block the lower half of the net, close that five hole really quickly. When they do that, it results in a transient force, a ground reaction force coming through the ice surface back into the goaltender's body, translating up directly into the hip. Now that's happening at the exact moment that they're in these compromised body postures. So there's a chance that we could be with too many exposures of doing this, we could be resulting in a greater amount of hip injuries, which is why we start seeing these values of 94% of elite goaltenders showing these um, the radiographic evidence for cam deformity. And last but not least, something we can't really control for, obviously, is underlying hip pathologies. Sadly, not all goaltenders were built the same. Uh, we're all our own little unique snowflake. Some goaltenders may have the genetic lottery of hips and they can have super wide butterflies post to post no problems whatsoever sadly others may not they may have a rotated femur anteriorly which decreases that gap between the femoral neck and the acetabular rim and that could potentially result in a earlier bone on bone contact when a goaltender is trying to have a wide butterfly something that is uh, that we can't really control for but we have to consider when people are developing we shouldn't just push people into the widest possible butterfly because that could cause injury so one of the first studies i actually did um, when i was working with ccm was looking at the compromised hip postures that goaltenders adopt when they drop into the butterfly and i'm going to talk about that a little bit today to kind of give you guys the picture of that balance between safety and performance so in this first study i'm going to draw your attention to the left hand image we had 12 goaltenders come in they were all junior level so some played in the ohl and some were playing uh junior B at the time. Goaltenders came in, you can see we put retroreflective markers on the front of the pads, on their gloves, and then along their pelvis, their femur, and then you can't really see it well, but there's also markers located on their skate and on the back of their calf as well. That allowed us to be able to track how the femur was rotating with respect to the pelvis, which is the images we see on the right hand side. In this particular project, we also tested four different goalie pad conditions, a control condition, which was the goaltender's current set of goalie pads, so what they were using within competition. We used a flexible tight leg pad, so a flexible pad with a tight leg channel, a flexible pad with a wide leg channel, and then we had a stiff pad that had a wide leg channel as well. And we'll come back to the effects that those different types of pads may have had on hip kinematics. Now, drawing your attention to the right images, so along the x-axis we have percent butterfly so we have goaltenders in their stance on the far left at around 40 percent they're in their butterfly full position and then at the far right of 100 percent they fully recovered the graph at the top is actually a flexion extension for hip flexion extension i should say and then at the bottom we have hip internal and external rotation Looking at the flexion extension curve specifically we see that as goaltenders are in their stance or in a, a larger flex position and when they drop into their butterfly they're more extended at the hips that makes complete sense because when you're down in the butterfly you need to make sure they're still blocking the top half of the net now drawing your attention to the internal external graph this one's pretty important what we're seeing here is these greater internal rotations in the horizontal dotted line and the horizontal solid line we have an active range of motion which is depicted by a goaltender being able to internally rotate their leg on their own so they would stand on one leg and actively internally rotate to their maximum degree and then the solid line is a passive range of motion where the goaltender was standing on one leg and then one of the researchers very slowly applied a small amount of force to see what their end ranges of motion were so that end passive range of motion creating that envelope between active and passive range and what we found is as, as goalies dropped into the butterfly they started to 
often increase their butterfly, um, sorry, as goaltenders dropped into their butterfly, they started to increase the amount of internal rotation they had and actually exceeded their active range of motion. So where they had a lot of support, where they could actually get to themselves with their own musculature, they were exceeding that point. And now coming a lot closer to that end or passive end ranges of motion. Now, if we want to look at that from a whole all 12 perspective, this is what we're going to look at on this graph. We have all 12 subjects along the X axis and we have hip internal rotation and degrees on the Y axis from top to bottom. So you actually had greater internal rotation the farther down you went. So you could see negative 70 degrees. We have active and passive range of motion. The inverted triangle is depicting the active range of motion, the amount they could get to. And then the upward triangle is actually the passive or that end range where you would potentially see a bone on bone contact of the hip. When we put all of the pad types in for each goaltender, we actually found that 75% of goaltenders were exceeding their active ranges of motion. So three out of four goaltenders are voluntarily putting themselves into these positions where they may actually have less muscular control, which potentially puts them in a, a state of danger. It's actually a really good idea to try to ensure that when you're getting stronger for goaltending, that you also strengthen your abilities at those end ranges of motion, specifically for butterflies, because that's where we're often hanging out when we're actually in our full, full butterfly position. Now, what about uh, a goaltender performance? Well, what we're going to look at here is butterfly width. We want to now know when they're in these four different types of pads, are we getting wider butterflies in one set of pads versus the other? And what we actually found, the only significant relationship we found was the flexible tight leg pads compared to the control, the pads that goaltenders were wearing in their own competition. So what they were wearing in their own junior games we found that the flexible tight leg pads actually had larger or wider butterflies and that resulted in a significant difference. And that amount was almost somewhere in the range of around two centimeters, two and a half centimeters, which again, those of you playing the home game right now, if your puck's on its end, it's one inch high, but that is two and a half centimeters. So this, uh, this butterfly width was an estimate for half the body. So that was actually only a half butterfly width estimate. So we could anticipate the flex tight pad giving you the uh, a better goal tender, sorry, a better butterfly width of about two inches, which is a huge advantage. Now, let's talk about the relationship between these two things. So I talked about performance with respect to butterfly width. I've talked about safety with respect to the amount of internal rotation, knowing that the greater the amount of internal rotation we have, the more likelihood we could potentially be putting our bodies into a compromised position where we could have bone on bone contact between the femur and the acetabulum. So on this graph, we have obviously performance across the X, we have safety along the Y axis. And so performance increases along to the right and safety gets worse as you go down. And what we found was this negative relationship. Obviously the more internally rotated your hips are, the farther or wider your butterfly performance was. Now, what's really important is, yes, there's a negative relationship here, but we have to look at the axes. We're seeing a butterfly width change of about two and a half centimeters, as I mentioned, but look at the amount of hip internal rotation that's needed in order to get that two and a half. We're looking at a hip internal rotation, again, of about of a degree and a half. At some level, yes, a degree and a half may be that difference between no contact and contact. However, a degree and a half is a small price to pay for having two inches of extra butterfly width when you're looking at the puck size. So I would say in this particular case, this is actually a good example of new pads or new pad design maintaining this balance of safety and performance. We don't want to push them too far and granted as pads continue to develop, we want to make sure that this curve doesn't get steeper and we don't want to make, we don't want to see it get too far down the way where we're actually really pushing people to their end passive range of motion. But what we are seeing is this inherent performance increase with a marginal uh, safety decrease. So this is really close, but I would give this a check mark on trying to maintain the balance and still improving overall performance. Now onto the second thing that we're trying to do, which is tracking overall performance. And this is a super buzzword. Again, many of you have probably already heard about all this stuff, but trying to track what goaltenders are doing the same way that in baseball, they've been having pitch counts for the dawn of time. And pitch counts being the 
If you get to 100, we need to be start worrying about you. We need to start to understand where is the line in the sand for goaltenders? Is it 100 butterflies? Is it less than 100 butterflies? We don't really know that. And naturally, that's going to change depending on who is the goaltender that you're working with. If you have somebody coming back from injury, it would be less. If you have somebody who's an NHL player versus uh, a young developing player, those numbers are also going to be different. But we need to start to understand what what are those pitch counts or what I like to consider butterfly counts? Again, focusing on butterflies because it's kind of the cornerstone movement for goaltenders. I've tried to do a few things within the lab to try to automate on ice tracking. And the reason for that is I showed a quick image earlier of a quick spreadsheet of online tracking or on ice tracking that has fallen on its face so many times. Um, Goalie coaches are too busy. It's a bit of an arduous task when goaltender coaches are probably watching for other things to have them actually sit and tick box things like they did an RVH or they did a butterfly or they did a backside edge to the left post into a VH. All these types of things. There's so many different modifications that can happen that it's very difficult to control it all and, and sit there with a tick box. It can be done actually in brute force. It's easily done, but it's very time consuming. So what I've tried to do a little bit in the lab is figure out a way to automate it. And as an example of things that we've used in the lab, these are a cost efficient um, inertial measurement unit. They're little accelerometers um, called Notch. Um, this isn't an advertisement for Notch. I want to be very careful with that. These little sensors can go on different body segments and they give you an estimation of where the body segments are in space. And also within the Notch platform, you can also get out the raw accelerations to be able to try to track through acceleration purely. And what I've done in the lab, even though they have a really great um, software or, or an application which you can actually see the bottom portion of it actually in the image here i've taken the raw acceleration profiles and tried to use that to estimate butterfly counts and i'm going to show you a small video of some of the code this is maybe a little bit dry but it's exciting the overall outcomes so here is just a snippet of the code in the bottom half and these are just the images of a goaltender me <laughs> so maybe not the best goaltender um, doing a series of different motions, whether it's RVH, uh, full butterfly, VH, and just full stance. And we did this kind of in a pattern. And what we managed to do out of the acceleration profile, so we put an accelerometer on the lower back on the pelvis, and we tried to identify a typical butterfly acceleration pattern. And if we look on the right-hand side, this is a typical butterfly pattern right? The acceleration. It's, it starts to accelerate downwards and then you make contact with the ground and you get a large transient force on the other side. And so maybe everybody's butterfly isn't, doesn't look exactly like this, but this is just so happened to be what I was doing. And so what happens is that when you run the code, you can just feed it this acceleration data. And as it works, so this is the, the raw file that would come in and you can see that the acceleration as it's reading through, will just match itself with the typical acceleration profile. And every time it gets a match, you get a green light. That's just a fancy thing to say that it, it's counting it. And then when the program's all done, basically every time it matches to a typical butterfly acceleration, you can then get the estimates out for the amount or the total number of butterflies that a goaltender has done. So this isn't me advertising a program. This is such bare bones. It's just proving that there is a really good opportunity for automation to be done for goalie tracking on ice so that we can get away from just manually ticking things. So if we look at the stats at the bottom, which right along the bottom here, we see that there were a total number of 10 butterflies done in this particular trial. There were um, estimated body impacts of 2.5 body weights with a mean uh, peak butterfly drop velocity of 1.87 meters per second, which um, that may not mean a lot, but that's um, not really the fastest. Again, it was me. If there was a, a competitive junior level goalie, you would probably see something greater than two um, in that situation. So another way that we can track goaltenders that's a little bit less onerous than trying to come up with the algorithms to be able to track on ice performance is simply just trying to track 
goaltenders off the ice by using qualitative measures. So one thing we've done at Dow, we've actually created a great partnership uh, between Health and Human Performance, Dalhousie Tiger Athletics, and a company called Kinduct, which is also based out of Halifax. And Kinduct is an athlete management software, and there's a number of NHL teams that are using it. Um, it's a perfect place to start when you're trying to do load management for these athletes, specifically goaltending. We can collect all this data, we can comprehend it, and we can start to make directed decisions. And a couple examples of what we can collect out of it are you have these body maps to get muscle soreness and things like that. You can get fatigue levels and sleep patterns, whether it's sleep quality, uh, and then on top of sleep hours. Um, but you can also garner ratings of perceived exertion so you can get session workout data so you could say all right if i worked out for two hours today and i had two hours of ice time and then an hour of off ice you would say that you had three hours of a workout and you could say within those three hours i worked out approximately uh, a seven on my rating of perceived exertion so you would just multiply your seven by your three hour timeline and you can start to get these session rpes so every single day you can start to track this combination of qualitative and quantitative data collection to be able to track workload in these athletes and it's a very simple way that that any goaltender coach could probably be tracking it with google forms um, not to speak ill of kinduct kinduct's perfect and you should use it but if you don't have the budget for that you could probably use google forms to get your goaltenders to fill that data out and you could start to actually track when you're getting big spikes in workload or decreases in workload. And those big spikes are often related to uh, the potential development of overuse injuries. So those are the things that we need to worry about. And that's really where we get into those reports can start to lead to great action. You can start to develop a bit of a load management program that goes beyond the well, I had a game tonight and now I'm not going to play the goaltender tomorrow. That whole back-to-back -back thing. Maybe your goaltender actually has had pretty low workouts and then you went in and laid a beat down on a team on the Friday night and your goaltender didn't really get much of a work, um, didn't get much of a workout out of it. Uh, maybe that's an opportunity to then go back to back with that goaltender because they still need that workout. They need to maintain that level of exercise. So doing these quantitative or qualitative data collection techniques, you may be able to advance your own goaltending uh, coaching platform, if you will. So basically the whole, the whole reason that we do any of this load management or trying to track these goaltenders is trying to decrease the environmental factors that cause injury. And those are the high number of reps, decrease those compromised body position that goaltenders are getting into with these high um, forces that get into the hip at the same time. So, I went over time by three minutes. I'm very sorry for that. But again, I want to thank Dr. Cheryl McDonald for the opportunity to do the talk today. Uh, it's an honor to be part of the Goaltending Symposium, and I look forward to having future conversations with everybody and potentially answering a few of your questions on the 30th. Thanks, everybody.